costly consequences of geomagnetic storms. 49 satellites were launched. 40 of those satellites are no longer operational. The UK's coldest day ever. It was reported at Braemar on the 11th of February 1895. And when apprenticeship turns into career. It was absolutely terrifying posting content on our social media as we have such a huge audience. It's Friday the 11th of February and you're listening to Weathersnap from the Met Office. Hello, I'm Claire Nazir and this is Weathersnap, an insider's guide to the week's weather headlines. Geomagnetic storms hit the headlines this week as a burst of solar energy coincided with the launch of 49 commercial satellites at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. It's now believed the energy release will cause many of the satellites to burn up before they reach their planned orbit. To find out more, I spoke to Krista Hammond, space weather forecaster here at the Met Office. What we know is that 49 satellites were launched and because of the impacts of a geomagnetic storm, uh, 40 of those satellites are no longer operational. Why was space weather an issue for these satellites? What we see in leaving the sun is something called a coronal mass ejection. And this is billions of tonnes of plasma, which is charged particles, which can head towards Earth. When they do, these particles interact with the Earth's magnetic field, the Earth's atmosphere, and it changes the temperature and the density of the atmosphere. And for satellites, this is a problem because this causes drag on the satellite and it alters their orbit. So it can cause damage to the satellites. Tell me the timeline from when the sun ejected all of this plasma and then the launch of these satellites. The 29th to 30th of January, we saw this mass leave the sun. And then it was a couple of days later that we noticed an arrival at Earth. And what we see then is we see geomagnetic storming. And the impacts from this lasted for a couple of days. So the impacts can wax and wane. So we've got an initial shock as the coronal mass ejection arrived and the geomagnetic storm started. And then it waned somewhat. And then we had an increase in activity the day after the launch. Is this something that happens quite often? We do see space weather of this magnitude relatively regularly. In fact, as we move towards solar maximum, which is where the sun works in the 11 year cycle, where we go from solar minimum, where we see the least amount of space weather, to solar maximum, where we see the most. As we start to head towards solar maximum, which is the part of the cycle that we're in now, we can expect to see a greater frequency of this magnitude of space weather event. This storm is what we consider a moderate geomagnetic storm. And obviously um, around this time, the northern lights have been visible, haven't they? So it's almost like you see evidence in the sky when there is a geomagnetic storm. Yes, the northern lights, the aurora, those are the most uh, visible example of space weather that we can see. It's exactly the same. So they might be beautiful, but this just proves that um, space weather can have a sort of real impact on a number of systems, including satellites, including satellite launches. Krista Hammond talking to me earlier. The 11th of February is a notable date in the meteorologist's diary. It's the day thermometers dropped to the lowest recorded temperature in the UK in a record dating back 127 years. So what was the temperature? And are we likely to break that record again? Here's our weather stats expert, Dr Mark McCarthy. It was an exceptionally cold start to February that year, 1895. So a succession of wintry and at times quite snowy weather. And just preceding this, we had experienced some reasonably heavy snowfall, particularly across parts of Scotland. And we were in a very strong easterly flow. So that term sort of beast from the east really applied to this 1895 event as well. But associated with it actually were a lot of clear skies, some quite sunny weather during the day. And this allowed for some really exceptionally low temperatures to occur overnight. And um, it was reported as minus 27.2 degrees at Braemar 
on the 11th of February 1895. Now that is a very long-standing record and has never been broken since but it has been equaled on two other occasions. Um, so 10th of January 1982 again at Braemar and on the 30th of December 1995 at Alt Nahara. Few indicators in data have suggested that we may never get to that point again or it's going to be very rare. Yeah, that's right. So our climate is warming, particularly over the last 30 years or so, through all seasons, including the winter. So the expectation alongside of that is that while we will still experience some extreme cold and extreme cold outbreaks, it is less likely that we get close to threatening some of these low temperature records. So, you know, you're the person who analyzes all the data, all the records, not only are frosts declining and minima increasing and maxima increasing, but also over a year, you take an average temperature for the whole of the UK over a year. All of the top 10 warmest years on record for the UK have occurred in the 21st century. This is in a series going back to 1884. Uh, so well over a century worth of observations. The UK has warmed by close to one degree since the mid 20th century uh, and that is true for both the daily maximum and daily minimum temperatures through all seasons we have seen that warming. So this increase in our overnight daily minimum has consequences through our winter season. My thanks to Dr Mark McCarthy. Next up, it's Ada McGiven with the outlook for the next few days. Following a fine Friday for most of us, the weather goes downhill this weekend. We will start off with some sunshine for East Anglia and the southeast on Saturday morning and a touch of frost here. But elsewhere, thicker cloud, more of a breeze and blustery showers will affect Scotland, Northern Ireland and some more persistent wet weather will drive into much of Northern England, the north of the Midlands, Wales and later parts of the southwest. And around coasts accompanying the rain, we'll see gales with gusts in excess of 50 miles an hour. Accompanying the wind and rain, however, is milder air, so temperatures will actually be rising through the weekend. We can expect 9 to 10 Celsius in places on Saturday. And then by Sunday, another area of low pressure gets picked up by the jet stream. Some uncertainty about how much this low will spin up on Sunday morning, but it's likely nevertheless to bring widespread wet and windy weather to much of England, Wales and southern Scotland during Sunday morning, clearing eastwards by the afternoon with brighter weather following to the west. Again, with that low crossing the country, you can expect widely windy weather with the risk of coastal gales. But if it does spin up into a deeper feature, and there is a small chance of that, then we can expect more widespread gales and disruptive winds for southern areas. Next week stays very changeable, with yet more wet and windy weather at times, particularly around the middle of the week when there is the risk of gales in places, particularly towards the north. Thanks, Aidan. This week is National Apprenticeship Week and as part of our occasional series profiling the various roles within the Met Office, we hear from Charlotte Warman, Communications Executive with the Media and Campaigns team and a former apprentice herself. I started my PR and Comms Apprenticeship at the Met Office back in June 2020. My motivation came from two things I suppose. I've always been interested in media and comms activities since taking on bits of work around that in my previous role. I knew that yeah I really enjoy this and I want to do it more. At the beginning while I was finding my feet still I was involved in the simpler things using social media, writing blogs, at first it was absolutely terrifying posting content on our social media as we have such a huge audience but you quickly get used to it and it was a really exciting change for me. I became a permanent member of the team in October last year. I'm still learning new things every single day but I'm officially one of the team and I'm involved in bigger campaigns now and also leading a few of my own smaller projects. Some of the key skills for this role are to be creative and you know to think outside the box a little or to try and find a way to reach the public 
in a way that they can relate to. It can be really exciting when the media pick up on a story we have written and they write about it in their paper or online. It's really important in this role, but also as part of the Met Office, that we provide facts and information to help people make better decisions to stay safe and thrive. It's really important for us to make sure that we convey the facts and the information for people to make their decisions on that. Charlotte Warman. And if you'd like to learn more about apprenticeships, visit apprenticeships.gov.uk. Just before we go, here with the week's weather extremes, it's well-seasoned meteorologist Martin Bowles. Here are the UK extremes for last week, recorded between Monday the 31st of January and Sunday the 6th of February. The highest temperature was a spring-like 15.0 degrees Celsius at Frittenden in Kent on Tuesday. Aboyne in Aberdeenshire was the coldest observation site. The thermometer here dropped to minus 2.8 degrees early on Friday morning. Moving 100 miles westward to the other side of Scotland, the highest daily rainfall was measured at Aknagart in Ross and Cromarty. 55.0 mm was recorded here on Thursday. The sunniest site was Shubury Ness in Essex, where 7.5 hours were measured on Tuesday. Thanks, Martin. That's it for Weathersnap. I'm Claire Nazir. Editor is Adrian Holloway. Weathersnap is a podcast by the UK Met Office. For the latest weather conditions where you are, download the Met Office weather app.